Hi, Nikita. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing well. I just came back from, uh, I spent the weekend in the rural area uh, of like the Novgorod region, which is less central than where I usually live. Looking at Russian villages, thinking whether it's possible to buy a house in a Russian village and still be not cut off from like the internet and the infrastructure of the larger country. Haven't come to any conclusion yet, but I'm looking at things. This is relevant to what we're going to talk about, because I want to get into, I mean, as people may have inferred, you are in Russia. Mm. And actually, let me introduce this further. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Nikita Petrov. Uh, familiar to some of our viewers and listeners, the main opportunity for that, though, would have been uh, for people who watched videos that we've done for our Patreon, for the Non-Zero Foundation's Patreon site. And I guess this is as good a time as any to plug that and tell people if they want to support uh, this kind of content, which means Blogging Heads TV stuff broadly, Meaning of Life TV stuff, or for that matter, the Non-Zero Newsletter. Uh, the place to do that is at patreon.com slash non-zero foundation. Now back to you. Uh, not coincidentally, you work with us at the Non-Zero Foundation, helping us do the various things we do. More relevantly to this conversation, you are in Russia. People mm -hmm. may have detected an accent. And we're going to talk about a lot of Russian things, including, to get back to uh, what you said about the Internet, including um, the question of how uh, media technologies have affected Russian politics and are affecting uh, Russian politics. Um, the uh, I think in America, people are very familiar with the idea that um, of, a, of a kind of a fragmented audience, people in different media ecosystems. Mm -hmm. I think there's a I have a theory that there's a different version of that in Russia. And I want to try that out on you. But in any event, I want to talk about Lots of things, Russia, you know, uh, people are getting poisoned uh, every once in a while there. You've got uh, unrest in neighboring Belarus mm -hmm. and the question of what Vladimir Putin will do about that. Um, and I want to just, in the course of discussing these things, help Americans and others better understand what things look like from Russia, what things look like to different people and different groups of people within Russia. Um and I have a theory that in some ways the perspective or perspectives from Russia will be more alien than Americans imagine. I mean, more unlike an American perspective, but in some ways you're really similar. That's my working hypothesis. Well, let's figure it out. Okay. Um, well, let's get back to uh, your situation first. We should say, I mean, another thing that's going on in Russia and America is, of course, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you alluded to possibly moving out into the country. Um, I hope you don't mind my revealing that it's a little late for you to escape the pandemic in that manner because you apparently have had COVID, right? Right. I'm an early adopter. I got, I got it, I think, like late January, early February, so before I realized it was a big thing. Uh, and so I feel a little silly having tried to avoid it after I actually was already ill with it and, uh, um, you know, survived it, I suppose. But how is that sense of smell working for you? Not, not back yet. The sense of smell is not back yet. And I have some other complications that I don't know how directly they're connected to, connected to COVID. Um, but it, it may be just like an old illness getting worse because of it. And I also don't totally understand how the um, the immune response works. I know that I now have, I, I recently taken um, another antibodies test after the one I've taken a few months ago. And I know that I now have fewer antibodies than I used to before. I don't really understand the numbers because it's not a quantity. So you, you have test. fewer than you had uh, when the illness was more recent? Yeah, I ha I, the illness was in early February, and then I had the test like half a year later, and then I got another test just a few days ago. And uh, uh, now I have fewer antibodies than the one time that I did test before. Okay. But I don't, know how, I don't know what to make of it. Like, I don't, 
there's not like a chart. If you have this many, then you're fine. And with if you have lower than that, then you're not fine. So it's part of the thing. One of the things that frustrates me about the whole pandemic thing is I don't totally understand how I need to use the information to guide my own actions. And uh, it's, it's all kind of vague and confusing. Well, yeah. And it is a complication that you have to think of these things as being on a spectrum. I mean... Right. There's a temptation to think of risk in binary terms, you know, like, how can I completely insulate myself from risk? Oh, no, I've gone out and gone within three feet of someone. I'll die, you know, and um, and for, for better or worse, it's more complicated than that. Um, are, are there um, what's your sense for the state of the pandemic in Russia, I mean, do people have a sense that they're getting reliable information about how widespread it is, how under control it is? What's the deal with this vaccine that apparently was approved there? Uh, so the vaccine is available. My mother just got a vaccine against the flu and uh, and pneumonia, and the doctors asked her whether she wants to do the COVID one as well. She said no, thank you, and the doctor really? said, yeah, and the doctor said that might be a good call. <laughs> and she didn't say i wish you told me that earlier <laughs> um they, the, there was even like an additional step there she said no i'm not gonna take that they said you know you can it's on a different floor of the of the same hospital you can go there you know ask questions they'll tell you all about it and she's like no mm -hmm. i think i'm gonna pass and they go we're we're doing the same too we're not there's another thing there that was uh, seemed interesting to me that i thought would probably sound strange to an american the doctor said they're not forcing us to take the vaccine yet. So we're waiting it as well. You know, we're not doing it. And I thought the idea that the doctors would be forced, that the doctors like have to think about like this is how they're thinking. They're not forcing us just yet. So right. we're gonna wait. I don't think doctors can be forced to take a vaccine in America, can they? Uh, it's a good question of how many people in general can be forced in America. I, I don't know what the status of that is. I mean, there are these anti-vaxxers who I think don't let their kids be vaccinated. And right. so I guess that means anybody has the right of refusal. But I don't really know what the law is. Um, you know, it was always just when I was a kid, it was just routine. Everybody did it. I mean, they gave you a gave you a sugar cube, which I think had the polio vaccine in it. And you, I was mm -hmm, happy to mm -hmm. eat that when I was a child. Um <laughs> The uh, so uh, so is there widespread mistrust of the vaccine? I, I mean, is is there a, is there a? And here we may get into different segments of Russian society, but how widespread is mistrust of the government, either generally or as it applies to COVID in particular? I think it's pretty widespread in 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 both uh, of these aspects. It's just it's just you you should. I, I don't know. I've never, I've never like in all my life in Russia, I've never really seen a person who, except for like an old uh, grandmother who spends a lot of time in front of TV because she doesn't have a lot of social life. Uh, most people you meet don't trust the government at all. It's not, it, not necessarily thinking they're evil and uh, they don't have our interest at, at heart at all, but just like, why would you trust them? Why, why would you? <laughs> so with the, so so with the with the vaccine, I think uh, I I haven't met a person who's like eager to do it. With the information about the pandemic generally, uh, there are the mistrust of the government is one part of the Russian psyche, and the other part is general kind of fatalism and apathy, and those two together give you a a, a view of the situation where it's probably worse than we think, but we're tired of wearing the masks. And so to hell with it. Like right now, the masks are not very frequent uh, in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Uh, businesses are back, uh, you know, mm -hmm. operating. I've seen, I don't know what the deal is with like live concerts because I've seen ads in the streets, but I think they're all for like open space stuff. Outdoors. But yoga studios work, stand up mm -hmm. is there, bars are filled. Saunas, it's all operating. Well, I mean, don't Russians, not to overgeneralize, have something of a fatalistic view of life? That is, I think that is correct, yes. I think that's a big part of what's going on here. Um, 
so you alluded to a grandmother watching TV. And I think uh, I gather that one divide that's a little sharper in Russia, and I think this is very politically relevant than it is in America, is the divide between a kind of Internet. People are really on the Internet and people who are pretty exclusively on TV in terms of where they're getting the information. I think in America, increasingly, there aren't that many people who just aren't on the Internet at all. My sense is that there are more people who fit that description in Russia and that that matters because the state controls old-fashioned media much more than they uh, control Internet content, right? Yeah, I think there is that generational generational uh, divide. I don't know where the bar is, like what age uh, you would think if you're above that age, you're likely to not be on the Internet, but I don't know, 60 and above or something? 60. Uh the internet is like that's changed a little like in terms of the government controlling the internet maybe not so much the internet is still pretty free uh though they have made advances there but there was a time like before crimea i would say when it was widely considered that the internet is basically anti-government like you, you more liberal um you know, attitudes are expressed there and you know it was not like oh, totally blanket like everybody who's online is 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 against Putin, but it was um, you know a clear sense that the internet has this com- completely different feeling to it uh, than TV, let's say. And I think since Crimea, the internet has become more divided, kind of like it is in America. You have ah, uh, the, so there's the there is camps. now like a pro Putin internet mm-hmm. ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, and okay. also also the same thing, just like. You guys in America are, are uh, you know, freaking out, some of you, about the Russian bots. That's the case in Russia, too. There are people who think that everybody who they meet online who's pro-Putin is not a real person, but a person who's being paid. Really? Yeah. And and then you can't, can't really figure that out. Like, it's kind of an article of faith. Do you think that the person you're talking to is a real person, or they're just pretending that these are their views? But in that case, do they? They don't think foreigners are behind it. They just think. Um, no, no. They just think pro-Putin Russians well, are, have set up these bots, or are... right. I suppose there's a connection the other way around. Like, if you're anti-Putin, then some of the pro-Putin people might think that you're uh, an agent of the West. But it's not, I think it's more like you've been duped by the West rather than you're being, there were these, like, I remember when I, w- when the first big protests were happening in Russia in, uh, you know, of the recent time in uh, 2011 and 12, uh, the state media was telling that these protesters are being paid by the Soros uh, Foundation mm. or Hillary Clinton personally. Uh, they've given out the, the thing that went kind of viral is, there was something about cookies that you get for free at the protests, and these are paid by Hillary Clinton. Well, maybe that derives from the uh, the Ukraine uh, upheaval, where uh, an American uh, diplomat, Victoria Newland, with the State Department, I think, was actually passing out cookies to mm. protesters on the Madonna oh, or go. something. Yeah. Um, and then there's also Hillary. But on the other hand, Hillary did famously say. A couple of decades ago, a few decades ago, I'm not going to spend my time baking cookies uh, <laughs> by way of establishing that she was uh, no doormat of a wife or something that 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 was controversial because it was taken by uh, certain uh, women who might call themselves housewives, I guess, is offensive. Um, anyway, the um, so the one place the internet versus old-fashioned media comes into play is with this guy Navalny who famously was poisoned and seems to be recovering from the poisoning he's it's I gather made a name for himself largely via YouTube which I guess is is pretty unregulated in Russia I mean he's he, he's he's done videos that just have millions and millions of views right yeah, and before that, when he was starting to get his prominence, this was through Live Journal, uh, which is a blogging platform. Okay. And for the lo- for the longest time, even after he you know became a, a obviously a valid 
politician, uh, you know, the main uh, critic of Putin, uh, a person who put out these numerous investigative reports and everything, for the longest time, the state media kept referring to him as a blogger to diminish his kind of prominence. I see. So he, he's, he got his start through these blog posts, uh, you know, investigative kind of stuff uh, about corruption. And then, uh, yes, it, over time, he developed a very strong, I think, YouTube game where he makes these, like, movies, basically, like, uh, good, uh, serious uh, journalist product that's not boring to watch. They put a meme here, there's plot, there's screenplay, and then they also deliver these facts. Um, uh, wait, are they corruption. actual movies in the sense of not being documentaries, or are they... No, they're documentaries, yeah. They're documentaries, they're, 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 they're like Sort of like a TV segment, I suppose, but some of them are like 40 minutes long. Uh, right. Very dense with information. And so I want to ask you, like, what is the thinking in Russia about how confident we can be he was, that he was poisoned with Putin's knowledge? But first, why don't we situate you a little more in the context of Russian society? Like, I assume that you are... A, you know, you're part of a, you know, a, okay, so you're fairly young and you seem to me part of what in America we would call cosmopolitan, you know, you're very much in touch with what's going on in the West. I think you're sympathetic with a certain amount of it. Um, you 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 actually lived in the United States for I don't know a couple of years or something working for I guess a software company a little more um, than a year yeah and uh, you know in America we would associate that with liberals with opposition to Trump and so on I mean and and, and then you would be able to go find people uh, in, including people of your age. Um, you know, who are on the other side of a, of a kind of a political divide is, I mean, first of all, I, I, I am I right about roughly where you fit in? Um, and how, how, how analogous is it to the American situation? So I think your description is correct uh, culturally, meaning, yes, I have been to a large extent shaped by Western popular culture, culture which is the case for many people, but maybe more so for me than for most. Uh, and I, I'm more in touch with what's going on in the West than most people I know. In terms e of even in your milieu, even in your relatively cosmopolitan milieu. Yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, my friends come to me with questions about America. Not that I can answer all of them, but uh, I mean, I'm I work with Americans. And other mm -hmm. people don't. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the political divide, I think it's we don't have this right left dichotomy as pronounced as you do. Uh, it's more like are you loyal to the regime or are you against the regime? But even there, um, I don't know. For the longest time, it was kind of shameful to be political at all. Like as I uh, said about these protests, of 2011, 2012, I was active uh, uh, in those movements. Mm -hmm. And the the reception that I've gotten at that time from almost like I'm, you're at the bar, you're talking with some friends and somebody mentions that you are somehow connected to anything political. And it's kind of, uh, you're looked down upon as a naive, foolish person who's wasting their time on uh, an ideological game. Now okay. it's not like that. Um, I think, like again, Crimea was a huge turning point when a lot of people became more political and more divided. Like mm. there are suddenly you you saw these really pro-Putin people and really anti-Putin people. So, so, so a significant number of people were against the taking the, over Crimea. Of course, yeah, yeah. But I, the one reason I ask is because I think Americans don't realize how close the historical association of Crimea and Russia. Are. I mean, in the Soviet Union, even within the Soviet Union until the 50s, Crimea was part of the Russian Republic, right? It wasn't part of the Ukrainian Republic. And then uh, another Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev, changed that in the 50s, right? And, and yeah. gave it to Ukraine, in effect. But, but it's ethnically— was Ukrainian, by the way. Oh, he—oh, oh, Khrushchev was Ukrainian. Yeah. 
What a coincidence. <laughs> um, so anyway, Crimea is very, uh, pretty heavily ethnically Russian. In any event, very heavily Russian speaking, right? Yeah, yeah. And most Crimeans wanted this to happen, I, as I understand it. We assume. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, there was a referendum that we can't really trust. Uh, mm -hmm. So that makes the whole conversation difficult. And then there's the second question of whether these, even the Crimeans that did want to be a part of Russia, how they feel about their choice now. Uh, and whether this was legitimate in any case, but yes, the historical connection of Russia to Ukraine is uh, oh, to to Ukraine too. But but uh, Crimea was a part of Russia, was given to Ukraine mm -hmm. by Khrushchev, and Putin sees it as uh, returning of the land to where it belongs. Then again, Putin, as far as I understand, from um, I don't think he said it uh, explicitly publicly. But there are reports from people who talk to him who that he really thinks that like Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, that is the same nation, uh, should be the same country, and it's kind of a historical hmm. um, screw up that these are different different territories. Which so it's kind of like ch like China and Taiwan in his mind, the the way that looks to the Chinese regime. I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. Um. And and is either of those stronger? Like 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 in terms of the if you just ask the average Russian, like which is more naturally a part of Russia, Ukraine, or Belarus? Would there be any big difference? If you ask a Russian, you'll you know you'll run into these different perspectives. So there are a lot of Russians who are really tired of that, what you would call imperialistic or something uh, mm -hmm. outlook, and they would just say, "Leave these people alone. Let's try to maintain a good relationship." as neighbors, as peoples that are close to one another, but not uh, so try to subsume them. Um, and then you see people who are like Putin, who think that these are sort of like the outskirts of Russia and should be a part of Russia. It's interesting, it was interesting to see, like when the upheaval in Belarus started, mm -hmm. I thought it was, somehow it seemed like even before I started talking to other people about it, it just seemed like a very different situation from the Ukrainian situation. In what way? In, in terms of how Russians perceive it, among other things. Because Ukraine was really uh, trying to make this uh, choice between Russia or the West. It was like the two sides were either pro-Russia or pro-integration with the European Union, mm -hmm. trying to get there. And uh, so in Russia, there were people who uh, were, were really against the oppositional movement. Um, and in Belarus, I think very wisely, both of the people, the sense that I get from the just the uh, people who go into the streets in, in Belarus and the uh, political, I don't know to which extent they're really leaders, but the, the, this, this woman who was the oppositional candidate who kind of happened to become the oppositional candidate because everybody else was either dismissed or put in jail. Including she her was, husband, apparently. Right. He was running, and then uh, when he was put in jail, she became the candidate uh, running on uh, the platform. I, I'm just going to uh, make sure that there is a new election that is honest. So she was not... Uh, and then, and then I, and then I will step. Uh, yeah, so like I will step down. I don't want to actually. I'm just a right. transitional figure. Right, and and that's. I think that's a big part of her appeal because she's not a career politician. She didn't want it to begin with. She is a woman who kind of stepped in in the moment of crisis and uh, all of that. Like at the beginning of the year, there was no, as far as I understand, there was no real oppositional movement. Nobody would think that uh, all these uh, hundreds of thousands of people would uh, be in the streets. And the somehow the trajectory of it all uh, led to a, there's just one candidate because everybody else was dealt with. And you can't really paint her as a villain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then by now, she's like exiled. She had to leave because she was pressured. And uh, it seems like she left this kind of cryptic video message about her decision to leave that uh, seemed to indicate that she was, some kind of a threat was made against, either against her children or her ability to see her children, something like that, and so she mm -hmm. left. Uh, but she keeps making, you know, giving interviews and making statements. 
So Russians are less divided on this issue than I, they were about Ukraine? I haven't seen a Russian who expressed any negativity towards the movement itself. Towards the towards the, Bela, the popular Bela, is it Belarusian or Belarusian? How do you say it? I suspect that's a controversy that you don't want to get into. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can figure out which side which kinds of people align on. I think it's, uh, there's a similar thing with Ukraine. Uh, and I think both have uh, expressions in the Russian and the English language. With Ukraine, in Russian, the way we traditionally would say in Ukraine would be na Ukraini. The preposition is on. It's just, mm -hmm. just this is how the language works. And then, um, and then Ukrainians were a, a, a big part of Ukrainians. And the further you go in time, the more Ukrainians were unhappy with it. They wanted to be in Ukraine, v Ukraini. And this became this linguistic battle, political linguistic battle that in English is, I think, um, mirrored with the difference. There used to be a time where people would say in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and I think now it's in Ukraine. And it's the same kind of, the, this all comes back to the, the meaning of the word Ukraine is kind of outskirts, like the, the origin of the words, like um, hmm. on the edge of Russia, it was. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the edge territory. And so when you, if you, in Russian, when you use na, it's kind of like you're sort of implying that this is there, uh, Ukraine is on the edge of Russia and, and, and Ukrainians didn't want When you that say to on me. instead of in? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that there is a similar thing in, with uh, Belarus, which you can say, like in Belarusian language, Belarusian language, you say Belarus in Russian language. I think you can say either Belarus or Belarusia. And mm. then there's this fight of what you're supposed does to Putin, say. Does Putin say Belarusia? Good question. I don't think so, actually. I think he says Belarus because it's mm. also the official name of It's like Respublika Belarus, the Republic of Belarus. Okay. Is one of the official. Anyway, there's just... Language is a battlefield in some cases, not only in like uh, pronouns for people who have uh, genders that don't fit into the old system. Yeah. Well, of course, so you said the, the peop Russian people seem less inclined um, to take a position against the, uh, the popular uprising in... Belarus, then they were to take a, a, a position, I mean, some Russian people, then they were to take a, a, a position against the, I don't know, I guess you'd say pro-Western people in Ukraine. Um, and, and in a certain sense, Putin, you could say that about Putin, right? I mean, he's he, he I has so. subtly signaled support for the existing regime in Belarus. The guy came to Putin kind of on hands and knees uh, in in a really vulnerable position, looking for any support he could get, and Putin said, "You know, here's a loan, here's some money." But he wasn't he wasn't all that emphatic, right? Isn't that the perception that he's he's not saying, "I'm going to send in the troops to save you"? Yeah, that was a, an, an interesting moment when Lukashenko first met. I, I think maybe not met. I think they had a phone call, and Lukashenko said, uh, "We have the support of." Putin and Russia, and uh, if uh, th they said that uh, as soon as we need it, they'll send us some troops, you know, so just be aware of that. And uh -huh. I think right after that, the, not Putin directly, but the Kremlin, um, you know, press uh, people came out and said, well, that's not exactly what, what Putin said in that conversation. Mm -hmm. He said, if there's an attack from the outside, then the treaties that Russia and Belarus have, it, we, we're called, Belarus and Russia have this thing, it's the, a union state. Like they're, there's a, like a union that's just made of these two countries. Mm -hmm. And they have these treaties. And so if, if Belarus is attacked by a foreign nation, then Russia does have to step in. And apparently that's what Putin said. And then Lukashenko started, there was this, I mean, Lukashenko is, that's part of the reason you don't see a lot of Russians who like are pro Lukashenko because he has been there for a long time and he's acting crazy. He's uh, mm. he he's been kind of a laughing stock for some time. It's just from uh, it used to be that people looked at him like an eccentric, weird guy that's 
says funny things sometimes, and now uh, he's seen more as evil. Uh, so one of the things that he did after that clarification from the Kremlin, he said that, okay, so there's things going on in Lithuania and Poland, I think, and uh, he moved some troops to the border mm -hmm. trying to play it as if somebody's trying right. to attack him when nobody was. His, <laughs> his since he, he published this, oh my God, there was this thing, he published a recording, he claimed that his uh, intelligence services uh, interrupted this, not interrupted, but um, you know, captured this transmission, a phone call between Warsaw and Berlin, I think. Um, that uh, we're talking, you know, it's like these Western agents who are talking about what they want to do in Belarus and how Lukashenko is kind of hard to fight. Uh, the people are really behind him, and then mm -hmm. th this and that, and it's, it's <laughs> you can't. I've never seen a person who believed for a second that this was a real conversation. It's so, hmm. it's such a movie. These people are talking as if they're like characters in a bad action movie about mm. uh, the fight of these superpowers. So that's one element. Lukashenko himself is, he has been there for way too long and he's acting crazy. And then B, and, and he's ruthless too. And then B, the oppositional movement is not pro-West, is not anti-Russia. Mm. It's very clear that uh, the people okay. just want democracy for themselves, not to be a pawn of this part of the world or right. of that part of the world. And this, uh, the presidential candidate, Tikhanovskaya, she just recently gave an interview in which she uh, three times called Putin or Moscow wise uh, mm. in trying to, like, it was, you know, the, the interviewer was asking these questions to kind of force her to position as against Putin or, or the, you know, to, to, to take this side. And she was trying real hard, it seemed, to not do that. And, you know, mm -hmm. she said, you know, I'm, I'm sad that Putin is talking to Lukashenko, not the Belarusian people, but being a wise political leader, he knows that uh, Lukashenko is not an ally and uh, he, he'd better at some point... Uh, side with the people, not with the regime. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, Stephen Cohen just died. He was a Russia expert in America. I assume that didn't get any press in Russia. You you don't. I don't think Because so. he was he was very eminent. Um he wrote a, a pretty famous in academic circles book called Bukharin and the and the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Do you know who Bukharin was, the historical Bukharin, figure yeah. in Russia? Yeah. yeah. So the average American wouldn't, but this was apparently a great book. Um and he was known for and sometimes derided for, especially in conservative circles, but even to an extent I didn't understand by kind of centrists, um, he was sometimes derided for his insistence on trying to convey the Russian perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't know, maybe he did go too far sometimes. I lost his perspective. I didn't really see it. But anyway... As far as Ukraine goes, he was the person I heard say that it was the European Union who had turned this into a binary choice. I mean, as you said, Ukraine was in, uh, I think you said, but anyway, they were in an economic uh, arrangement with Russia, somewhat as Belarus is now, I assume, where there's relatively free trade between the two, relatively low tariffs. And I think Cohen said that the EU, you know, made no effort to work out a deal where, well, you can you can maintain, you know, l let's figure out a kind of special relationship you could have to the European Union where you would maintain a certain amount of that special relationship with, with Russia. And so, and Cohen's telling the EU forced Ukraine to choose, and that turned it into this this binary and very contentious issue. You're either with Russia or you're with the European Union as a matter of economic integration. In any event, um, sounds like that isn't happening in Belarus. Nobody's saying we want to join the, you know, uh, and, and I mean, Belarus is not part of the European Union, are they? 
No, no. And and, and, and they're not. It sounds like sounds like what's that? Neither is Ukraine. I don't think, and I don't think is there Ukraine are, still not. They're still not part of the EU. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a a quick path to that either. It doesn't seem like the European Union is like, yeah, let's get a new country right in. No, it, it does take a while. I mean, Turkey yeah. was forever being promised that you know any any moment now they'd start taking its application seriously, but it, it never happened. Um, the uh, so anyway, there's nothing. There isn't apparently this big contingent in Belarus that's a prominent part of the popular movement that wants to uh, that wants to integrate with Europe and and more or less divorce itself with Russia. So that's the big difference. Yeah, I think I think the Belarusians are are standing more firmly on. They just want sovereignty. They yeah. just want uh, uh, to be able to elect their own president. Um, yeah, and in Ukraine there was more of the. Uh, the clash between the sides and it's it's i don't i i can't tell you much about this like uh how much the european union uh, has forced ukraine but it's i think there are historical kind of cultural reasons for that too that was like the country is more divided uh, ukraine is uh the west and the east the east is more russian speaking the west is more Ukrainian speaking, there were more nationalist Ukrainian nationalists mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Uh, the West, by which I don't necessarily mean anything negative, but like a national pride and uh, you know people who would uh, try start wearing like old fashioned uh, old uh, traditional outfits and stuff, uh, who would have a. There are these problems with the Russian language, like uh, the new administration, I guess, at some point. Um, got some or much of Russian language out of the schools uh, mm-hmm. where Russian-speaking people would prefer to learn in Russian and so forth. So that, that there were more tensions there to begin with kind of cultural for cultural and historical reasons. But okay. Belarus, I think, is staying uh, pretty firmly right now on like not making it uh, a thing about Russia or the West. Okay. Now, as for Navalny, um, who I gather isn't... Uh, there isn't a real uh, close connection between these two issues, I gather, between Navalny and, and the Belarus um, issue. I mean, he would presumably be in favor of of, uh, of something more like true democracy in Belarus, but aside from that. Although, you know, one thing I heard about him is you shouldn't think of him as so much a pro-democracy guy as an, as, as an anti-corruption guy. Is that right? I wouldn't say so. I think he's pretty democracy is he his is. big thing. Yeah, it is. He did have, especially in the beginning, he had these. Um, he had to fight this battle of public perception. He used to be somewhat aligned with nationalism. He actually tried to found uh, a, a movement that had the word nationalism in the title, and so he had this like the negative connotation that has been with him from the early days. And uh, way less so now, but he had to deal with it for for quite a bit of time. Is that he's like a nationalist, a Russian nationalist, but democracy, I think, has always been his. Like he, I don't think he's wavered on that. Uh, at any okay. Moment. So what is the thinking in Russia? In America, it's pretty widely assumed, except on kind of the far left, maybe. That Putin poisoned him, and it's pretty. It's that straightforward. What is the thinking like in Russia? I see. With all this stuff, is like it's difficult to say confidently what the consensus is. Like, well, say, say in, let's start with your milieu, because in I think in the in, in the American analog of your milieu, it would be assumed that Putin poisoned him. Period. I think, except again on the kind of far left, but. I think what, what what are your friends saying? I think that's the 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 opinion that is spread the widest. Um, and then I guess the counter thing is not so much a competing theory, but uh, like here's who poisoned him again. There are, I've heard I've heard a couple of ideas, but they're kind of thrown in. Like maybe this makes sense, maybe that makes sense, but uh, there's not like a unified, coherent narrative uh, uh, that, that proposes something else than Putin poisoned him. Uh, but people, there are, I think, some people who say 
why would he doesn't seem uh that this is beneficial to him or you know something's fishy something mm -hmm. like that but uh i haven't heard like a very like a prominent uh theory that's not like that but just to uh, just to th this is the main thing that i wanted I, I wanted to start the conversation with is that the biggest news i think for me coming out of not so much russia but germany i suppose now because Navalny is in germany trying to um get back into his health after this coma that uh, the poison landed him in. Uh, he he started just a few days ago, he started posting on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if the latest post was written by him or like the first one, uh, he just said it uh, and, and somebody else typed it. But the most recent one that I saw today is this heartbreaking, heartwarming, inspirational thing about love uh, because he details the state. He, he he describes the state he was in after he got out of the coma but still was not aware what's going on. He couldn't... Uh, the, the, his day would start with a doctor appearing with either like um, a piece of paper or whiteboard saying, let's write a word down. Think of some word and let's write this word on this piece of paper. And he couldn't because he didn't have words. He didn't know where in his mind to locate the words. Wow. So, so he was in this uh, state, you know, of complete disorientation and uh, and barely aware of, of what is happening. And he says that his first, not even memory, but a uh, set of emotions that he started to experience is this, like when he was alone in his room, he was waiting for her, and he says, I didn't even know who her was. Just there was this presence, the feminine presence that I was mm. waiting for, and then when she did arrive, I felt better. And that was the the thing that oriented his whole being, his whole experience at the time. And that was his wife? And that was his wife who would come and you know tell him stories and sing songs and uh, talk wow. to him. And he couldn't comprehend what she was saying, but mm. he felt and feels now that this is what helped him immensely to recover it's funny how the mind does that it's like sometimes when you can't remember who told you something you uh you think about the category they're in and that tells you something about the way the mind organizes information mm -hmm. like you might think it's a high status person like you know reagan uh ronald reagan after he had alzheimer's there was this story about how George Schultz, his former Secretary of State, came in to see him, and he didn't know who he was. But after Schultz left, Reagan said to his wife, "He's a very important man, isn't he? Hmm. Like you, you, you know, um, it just tells you something, I guess, about the human mind. Um, but that is sad. So, so he kind of had in mind that, like, reassuring feminine presence. That was the extent of the specificity. Kind, it sounds like." I think so, uh, but also, but also, like the most important thing that was happening in his life, right? And and now right. he's, and so now he again. I don't know if the latest post was typed by him or not. The first one wasn't, um, but his style of writing is there. His humor is there. He in the photos he doesn't look too bad. As I saw somebody joke, like a a movie director said, "Why is it that Navalny after?" We didn't know if he's gonna survive. He was in this coma. Now he's posting these pictures. He looks better than I have ever looked. Why does life? Why? Why is life so unjust? Um, so we are hoping that he will recover, but we uh, fully we don't know. And and nobody has seen video, right? No, we haven't heard him talk or anything. But hopefully he'll get better. So when you say most Russians seem to think Putin did it. Does that mean that that means it was done with Putin's knowledge as opposed to, say, because, you know, Navalny had a lot of enemies, I think. He had oligarch enemies right. who were more who had varying degrees of relationship to the government. And some of them may have known people in, you know, in the intelligence business and could have gotten this. I mean, one distinctive thing about this is that they chose to use like a signature state government poison they could have used arsenic but no it's one of these poisons associated with the government and so you'd think that means either the government wants to send a signal 
and and say, uh, you know, don't mess with us. Uh, and I'm sure there's a strong incentive for Putin to do that uh, because a, a person like Navalny is a real threat to him. Uh, yeah. Or it's somebody who wants to, th- you to think it's the government who did it when it, when it wasn't. Um, but what is the, um, you know, I, I assume there's this gray zone where it could be an oligarch associated with a government. But I would think that if an oligarch did it, they would only do it if they felt confident that it would meet with Putin's approval, even if they didn't get authorization, right? That's what Navalny's people say. That's their argument. When they say Putin did it, they say this kind of decision cannot be made without him. You're in like, if you're an oligarch or whoever, a, a local governor who has beef with Navalny, you're not going to go over Putin's head to make this kind of decision because you know that Putin is going to be in trouble with the West. There may be son- sanctions and so forth. Right. Um, I personally... Of course, that assumes Putin finds out who did it, but anyway. Yeah, I personally who... don't don't know how you can know who did it, how these systems work, how, how much agency other actors have uh, outside of Putin. Um so I don't the, the skeptics of the Putin did a theory. Uh, I think they actually point to Novichok the the poison as a thing that they don't trust. They uh, some of them see it as like maybe the West did it to make Putin look bad. Um, and of course he's in Germany right now, uh, and I guess the German military was a part of the like analysis. Uh, the 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 hospital asked military experts about the Novichok connection. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I guess the, 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 the point that I've heard from the skeptics about Novichok is like, this is a weird poison that they use to not quite kill people. Like it's supposed to be this really uh, dangerous drug that is, uh, you know, the, invented by the secret services to confidently kill people, but the recent victims survived. And meanwhile, like Nemtsov, who, who was a different oppositional figure, was just shot point blank in front of the Kremlin, and on the on that bridge, right? That that is now many people call by his name Nemtsov Bridge, uh, and people bring flowers there. And you know that's a very simple, straightforward operation. You just yeah. shoot a guy, and uh, like his, the, uh, we never found out who uh, was behind that murder. And uh, you don't need, there's not this connection, as you say, like the government is trying to send a signal, et cetera, that you just can shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know, somebody killed him. Yeah, I mean, the thing about this kind of poison is, I gather, if it doesn't kill you, it still may impede your functioning for a long time, possibly forever. Yeah. And in a way, that's a more powerful message to send. I mean, I mean, I mean it's like, if, if, if would-be dissidents... And activists get the message that look, they'll do something to you that either kills you, right, or or seriously messes up your life. It's like, no, that's a disincentive. Um, for sure, yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, it could it could if his recovery is complete enough for him to be a functioning activist, it could turn him into. You tell me, couldn't it turn him into a more powerful figure than ever? I think you. Yeah, at this point, it's hard to like dismiss him or he's just doing it for his own gains and uh you yeah. know a cynical uh whatever look person looking for profit no his his life is obviously at risk uh he already said even before we said we saw anything directly from him like his direct speech there were these people quoting him mm-hmm. uh one of the first thing he said i'm con- you know once i get better i'm g- getting back to russia uh you're not going to scare me out of uh, out of my right. activities. Of course, we don't know whether he can still be like an effective orator or or right. whatever. But, right. but, yeah, no, he could. It, it seems like he could be an effective something already. I mean, um, so uh, and do you think he, he and 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 future people like him pose a real threat to Putin? I mean, and this is quite, partly a question about like the media landscape. I mean, does does the state really fundamentally not have control of the internet, and and will it be not practical for it to 
seek and gain the kind of control of the internet that say the Chinese government has mm-hmm. um you know do do you uh, and this is also a question about the logic behind you know how strong the logic would have been for Putin to, Putin to poison the guy you, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do it unless the guy, unless people like him are a real threat if you're Putin this to me has become a more complicated question in this year because this year is weird uh, you know, they it used to be like a year ago, you would talk about these political realities. They used to say how much control the state has of media, what um, moods are there in in the population, and so forth. And now with the pandemic, well, for it, I mean, I remember when Corona was not yet taken seriously in Russia, but um, it became a thing in Europe. When they said that in Mo- the first thing they said that in Moscow, rallies of more than five thousand people are gonna be banned, and it seemed like a totally obvious, like because and and the day before that, a ra- not even the day before that, it was made this this uh, decision was made on the same day as an oppositional rally was scheduled against the changes to the constitution that Putin mm-hmm. was making. Which well, it's now, so obviously a bullshit number, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. if 10,000 is a threat, is a health problem, then God knows, you know, 4,000 is a health problem, right? I mean, was right. the, the the pretext was that rallies larger than 5,000 were some kind of threat that rallies yeah, of 4,000 yeah. so, I mean, this, this was early on when uh, it's not like right now I feel we have a coherent strategy, but back then uh, there was even, um, you know, a more stark lack of a coherent strategy or understanding of what's going on at all. But uh, I'm bringing this up as an illustration of, like, at that time, to me, uh, and I think to most people, the political reality, like these questions of Putin's ratings and what's going to happen, whether there's going to be a mass protest movement or whatever, like these... Uh, questions took precedent, they were more important, seemed more uh, real, sort of, than the pandemic. At the time, we didn't understand uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. And now, to me, it's kind of hard to even think about these, like, political campaigns and stuff when everything seems to be... uh, You know, we didn't didn't know that you could lock the country... Not the country down, but... Uh, yeah. uh, these kinds of changes, unprecedented changes in in what is allowed, what is not allowed, the masks and everything. So in Moscow, they had this very strict, apparently, so they tell me, lockdown for a little bit, where they tested some of these uh, sort of like China-like digital capabilities, where you had to have a QR code to go anywhere. Um, uh, you, you you go on an app to get uh to, f- for them to allow you to go travel somewhere else mm. the mm. old people for a while were not allowed to leave the house at all and mm. so none of that was ever on the table and then suddenly it was and it was just something that you kind of accept and mm. then pretty soon it became something that's not a part of our life anymore because it's all back up and and we don't know like I don't understand it, to be honest. I, I guess maybe there was like a miscalculation about the how how serious the illness is or what, but it's, you know, early on they were saying if we don't have this lockdown, then the hospitals will be overrun and it's this total collapse of the healthcare system. And I guess not anything has changed, right? But now we're back open and apparently the hospitals are not overrun. And then they're talking about the next wave of the lockdown or of the pandemic and the lockdown. And so it all became, I think, the, the, the prevalent mood in Russia shifted from what you believe politically, who you support politically. Like all these questions took a, a backseat compared to do you have a job or do you not have a job? What do you think is going to happen? Are we going to die or not? Is it safe to go outside or not? Uh, these questions became more, or personal connections. Do you still mm-hmm. meet with your friends? Do you still visit your mother? These things uh, came to the forefront, and I think politics is, for now, is in this kind of, I don't know, hiatus mode. So is the sense that it hasn't been that bad? I mean, that it's 
it has been more or less under control, leaving aside the question of whether there's going to be a big second wave? I think the sense, again, the prevalent sense, and again, I don't have like uh, a study to quote, and if there was a study, I wouldn't trust it probably. Uh, but I think the prevalent sense is it hasn't been under control, but it's also not the end of the world. Life goes mm-hmm. on and we, you know, you don't see like, you know, people dying in the streets. It comes back to this fatalistic attitude of Russians. Like, I'm alive. Mm-hmm. I know some people who have it. They, Some of them are not alive. Some of them are. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, in my case, I had it. I survived. So it's like... It's also, there's also an expectation, like when it started to go down, I, uh, and I think many were expecting it to be worse, not even because of this, like what we know about the pandemic. It's more like we know that things don't go, you can't just like have 30 years of not a huge crisis with people dying and stuff in Russia. And so maybe this is the one that our generation goes through. Yeah. Um, I mean, even in America, there, there, there are uh, people who who think the whole thing's being overblown. I mean, they point out, right. look, it kills almost entirely people who didn't have decades left to live, probably, um, and it kills a small number, relatively small number of people. If you look at human life years lost. We may not yet be up to, say, the Vietnam War. Um, and and then there are the people, the subset of those people who are saying, like, this is like a plot. This is like, well, the, well, the extreme version is probably they're just making it up. But the intermediate kind of conspiracy theory is the government is, or some parties, are using this to exert some kind of mm-hmm. social control they want to exert. I kind of feel like that about the Moscow lockdown, that they had an opportunity to test the capabilities that they were they have mm-hmm. been working on with the tracking of mobile mm-hmm. data with these like mm-hmm. uh, QR codes that you need to get to go outside. Uh, I kind of feel like that. I mean, it seemed that Sabiani was taking the, the pandemic. This is the Moscow of mayor was taking the pandemic seriously, but uh, I think it all is also what uh, was a chance for them to, you know, test the stuff out, see how, see how it works. And then, I don't know, now it's all back. Now all the businesses are open, and uh, it's as if we didn't have to do the lockdown. I don't know. And so Putin is not getting a lot of blame for mishandling it or anything. I mean, some people blame him, but I think the general, again, feeling is nobody expected the government to step up and do a great job. So it's Just because that's not an an expectation of the government to begin with there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I made this uh, in collaboration with uh, an artist that I know. We made this uh, little animation that was playing on. Was trying. We were trying to make a a, a joke about Putin's um, addresses, his COVID addresses. Uh, the joke was, I don't know if it's too complicated to explain all of this. There's this lo-fi mixes on YouTube where it's like background music for people, for students to study or for people working on a deadline, just something that doesn't distract you from your work, uh, Mm -hmm. calms you down and you go about your, the thing that you need to be doing instead of procrastinating. And we put uh, this mix in the background of Putin's COVID address, the joke being that he's doing the same thing as these, uh, these mixes. He would, he talked for an hour, it didn't say much of substance, but his tone was, uh, it, it like, it, it even in terms of audio, it kind of works together well, because he just has this rhythmic thing that's kind of calming you down, you know, and, and he starts talking, the opening remarks are, he says something like, you know, it's been three years since I, f- it's three months since I first addressed you about the dangers of COVID, and usually, Three months is not a long time. It passes very quickly. Sometimes we don't even notice. But now, these latest three months were completely different. And he just goes on with these, like, we learned about the importance of human connection. And we were inspired by the people who helped uh, when we didn't expect them to help. And it's just this, like, poetic ruminations um, 
about the, the stressful situation we're in, but we're gonna survive because we got all together and we're dealing with this. And it seemed to me that this is the main thing he was doing. And, and he took that part seriously. Like, I need to address the people and just soothe them and just yeah. say that everything's gonna be okay. And uh, that more than the actual policies yeah. where he's focused at the time. It's Trump, Trump has tried some of that, but he's just, it's soothing just is not part of his nature. Uh, he, <laughs> he, he's not good at soothing us. Уважаемые граждане России, 25 марта я впервые обратился к вам в связи с угрозой распространения коронавирусной инфекции. Прошло всего три месяца. Обычно такой период, один квартал, пролетает быстро, порой даже незаметно. Но в эти, безусловно, сложные дни, недели, месяцы, у всех нас было совсем другое ощущение времени. Слишком многое они в себя вместили. Резко изменившийся уклад жизни, вынужденные ограничения для работы и общения, Тревоги и опасения, и даже горечь потери, разлуки с родными и близкими, мысли о том, что будет завтра, как защитить, оградить от беды самых близких людей, как обеспечить семью, детей, поддержать родителей. Но несмотря на то, что is he like a pretty good speaker? I, I mean, his background is not really in politics. It's in, it's in, you know, KGB. Um, is he, uh, um, is he pretty good at that kind of thing? I think he is effective. I think, I mean, people have the, their different opinions. With that, that thing that we made with the uh, lo-fi beat behind his speech, it was interesting to see the reactions when I showed it to people, because. There were definitely, in, as you say, in my milieu, some people who are like, why would you do that? How mm -hmm. would anybody be able to listen to this fucker for a whole hour? You can't, like, they had this visceral reaction just to his voice. Uh, but many people said that, it, wow, it actually works. And it, it works because he is good at these. I think that mood is his best. Like mm -hmm. when he, uh, it's like, it's like what he does every new year. The the president addresses the nation on the new year mm -hmm. uh, eve. And it's always this mood. He's like, the year was not a, an easy one, but we went through it. And we remember at this time that the family is the most important thing. And the, this kind of thing, I think, I think he's mm -hmm. much better at than, let's say, like, uh, or even I was about to bring up the, like, parade speech that I listened to, the most recent one, the Victory Parade, which mm -hmm. he, that was a weird thing too. The Victory Parade is in May. He postponed it to September, I think. That's that's the May Day Parade, August. May 1st. No, that's May 9. This is when we celebrate. This was like the end of the war for Russia. Is that different from the May Day? I, I remember there was a, this one where like Brezhnev used to stand there for like hours as people paraded by. Is that right. that one? That's a different one. May Day is the, well, okay. he, I think Brezhnev did the victory parades as well, but uh, the first of May is Labor Day. Uh -huh. uh, so what did, what did Putin do that was odd? The parade was very important for him. Uh, he, I think he takes these symbolic things very, very seriously. And uh, so they had to cancel the parade because it was the height of the pandemic. And then they did it anyway. I forget, was it August or... It, I think it was August uh, when they held the parade, though, with, like, class attendance. And there was this weird kind of uh, tension between the mayor and the president because the, mayor, the, the president is sat on doing the parade. And mm -hmm. the mayor's like, yeah, but don't go there. Y you can, but don't stay at home and watch it on TV. Hmm. And... Hmm. Uh, and so the, the, it was just this weird thing that uh, is like the May 9th parade that happens on a different month. And uh, the, the reason I was bringing it up is the speech that he made there was more like warlike uh, and this like kind of shouting patriotic thing. And I think he kind of sucks at that. Mm. Uh, it, with the, the soothing kind of uh, wise mm. old man suits him better. Even when he does talk about the 
you know the the second world war is a huge thing for him and he makes it it's uh, like a, a cornerstone part of the ideology that he's trying to create the, the the view of the world for russians and even there he can be good when he talks about like the suffering that the country has endured yeah. and all that kind of stuff but when he gets warlike it's it uh, i don't think is yeah most is americans aren't 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 probably aware of how many russians died in world war ii um uh prob probably uh, there, <laughs> a whole lot of americans aren't aware that russia was an ally in world war ii much less how many uh lives were lost in the cause um millions yeah Tens of oh millions. yeah way but i mean yeah so um well we've been going more than an hour we should probably wind it down um is there anything else you want to say about Russia per se? I mean, I know there's there's some kind of metaphysical issues you 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 are interested in discussing, and I think we should save those for a future conversation that maybe would be technically on Meaning of Life TV rather than Blogging Heads, although they would all be in the Right Show mm -hmm. podcast feed. Um, uh, having to do with panpsychism, this particular view of consciousness, and and some sort of connection of that to politics that it would take you a while to try to convince me of i think so uh to the extent that i understand it at all so we'll reserve the appropriate amount of time for that um and we should also say that you know people want to see your work uh the nausea newsletter pretty much always includes some art that you've done some illustration mm -hmm. or something um and uh you've also we're doing more and more in the way of kind of you know animated uh we're experimenting with animated things that draw on content from blogging heads, meaning like TV. People will see more of that online, probably. Uh, where uh, they can follow you where on Twitter? Uh, Nikita S. Petrov and P -E -T -R -O -V. I T A. Yeah, ending with a V. Nikita yeah. S. Petrov. That's Twitter, and uh, I have a newsletter that I put out very rarely. Uh, that's on psychopolitica.com. That's the most important. Uh, stuff for that's, me, that's where you talk about all the all the drugs you take when you're not working for me that is one part of it yes that's not the whole of it but drugs do come up um okay well as long as i'm not paying you to do it and as long as uh it's either legal or you're doing it in a country other than the united states uh, no, um, yeah. i mean the, the borders are closed. i mean we should say these are not these, these are uh these are not um, hedonistic drugs, I think, right? You no, I, ta I take my drugs taken very seriously and, and responsibly, and it's all for the better mind of my life and of mankind's. Except for the alcohol, and doing that responsibly is not allowed in Russia. It's just a different way of seeing what is responsible, what is not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so um, anyway... Uh, you'll there will uh, you'll show up again at some point in conversation with me, mm -hmm. and um, and again if people want to support the whole enterprise, oh well that's another place they can see your art. If they go to Patreon.com/slash Nonzero Foundation, they will see uh, your drawings and you know and all an there occasional can... conversation that is only available there. Uh, we've we, we used right. to do these for, more for, regularly. I think we are going to continue doing some of those. Right. Uh, th there are there is uh, patron only content, including a number of conversations between you and me, and also uh, some with my longtime friend, sometimes nemesis, uh, Mickey Kaus. We do one every week, and um, those are available both to patrons of that enterprise per se and to uh, Non Zero Foundation patrons. Okay, well, thanks, Nikita. So we will uh, see you down the road. Yeah, thank you.